but by God's mercy a calm followed, and they brought up the ladder. His disciples wore the hair of his head and beard glued to the skin by icicles, and his face was hidden by ice as though it were covered by glass and could not be seen and he was quite unable either to speak or to move. Then they made haste and brought cans of warm water and large sponges and gradually thawed him, and with difficulty restored his power of speech. When they said, You have been in great danger, Father, he answered them as though he were just awaking from sleep and said at once, Believe me, children, until you woke me, I was completely at rest. When the terrible storm broke and my garment was torn off me by the force of the winds, I was in great distress for about an hour, and then after a violent fainting fit I called upon the merciful God for help. And I was wafted, as it were, into sleep and I seemed to be resting on a magnificent couch and kept warm by rich coverings and I saw an old man sitting on a seat by my head, and I thought he was the man who met me on the road when I was coming away from the blessed St. Simeon's enclosure and he appeared to be talking with great love and sincerity and he pointed out to me a huge hawk coming from the east and entering this great city and finding an eagle's nest on the column in the forum of the most pious emperor Leo. And he came and settled down in the nest with the eagle's young and then no longer appeared to be a hawk but an eagle. And I inquired of the old man what that might mean. And he answered. There is no need for you to learn that now but you shall know hereafter. And whilst he held me in his arms and warmed me, the same old man said very pleasantly, I love you dearly, I wanted to be near you, many fruit-bearing branches are to blossom from your root. And as we found pleasure in each other you did not do well in waking me, for I was delighted at meeting him. Then the disciples said to the holy man, We pray your forgiveness, but truly we were in great despair for we thought your holiness had died. What do you think that vision means, Father? He said to them, I do not understand it clearly, but God will do what is pleasing to him and expedient for us. But his disciples tried to interpret the vision and said, It behoves you with the help of the emperor to bring the corpse of the holy and most blessed Simeon to this city. For it appears from the vision that this is the pleasure of the blessed Saint Simeon. The servant of God said to them, Fetch another leather tunic and wrap me in it. And the emperor considering the peril through which Daniel had passed, said, It is not right for him to stand naked and unprotected and incur such dangers. And he went up to him and begged him to let him make him a shelter of iron in the shape of a little enclosure. But the holy man did not wish it saying, Our sainted father Simeon, did not have anything of the kind although he was far older than myself, therefore it is right that I who am young should practice endurance and not seek ease which relaxes the body. But the emperor replied, You have spoken well, father, and I approve your resolve, for I rejoice in your endurance, when I see, too, the help of God which constantly sustains you. For this reason a crown is being woven for you, yet be willing to serve us for many years, still, and therefore do not kill yourself outright, for God has given you to be fruitful on our behalf. With these arguments he with difficulty persuaded the holy man to accept his offer, and then the shelter was made. And from that time on the holy man remained untouched by storms. All the visitors who came from different nations, were they kings or emperors or ambassadors, the emperor in person would either take them to see the saint or send them up, and he never ceased boasting of the saint and showing him to all and proclaiming his feats of endurance. About that time a certain Zeno, an Isaurian by birth, came to the emperor and brought with him letters written by Ardeberius, who was then general of the East, in these he incited the Persians to attack the Roman state and agreed to cooperate with them. The emperor received the man and recognizing the importance of the letters he ordered a council to be held, when the senate had met the emperor produced the letters and commanded that they should be read aloud in the hearing of all the senators by Patricius, who was master of the offices at that time. After they had been read the emperor said, What think you? As they all held their peace the emperor said to the father of Ardeberius, These are fine things that your son is practicing against his emperor and the Roman state. The father replied, You are the master and have full authority, after hearing this letter I realize that I can no longer control my son, 
for I often sent to him counselling and warning him not to ruin his life, and now I see he is acting contrary to my advice. Therefore do whatsoever occurs to your piety, dismiss him from his command and order him to come here and he shall make his defence. The emperor took this advice, he appointed a successor to Ardaberius and dismissed him from the army, then ordered him to present himself forthwith in Byzantium. In his place he gave the girdle of office to Jordanes and sent him to the east, he also appointed Zeno, count of the domestics. And the emperor went in solemn procession, and led him up to the holy man and related to him all about Ardaberius plot and Zeno's loyalty, others told him, too, how Jordanes had been appointed general of the east in place of Ardaberius. The holy man rejoiced about Jordanes and gave him much advice in the presence of the emperor and of all those who were with him then he dismissed them with his blessing. Some time later it befell that a report was spread that Genseric, king of the Vandals, intended to attack the city of Alexandria, this caused great searchings of heart to the emperor and to the senate and to the whole city. So the emperor sent his Spathrius Hilasius, who was a eunuch, to inform the holy man about Genseric and of the emperor's intention to dispatch an army to Egypt. Hilasius went up and delivered the emperor's message to the holy man, and the holy man said to him, Go and say to the emperor, Do not be troubled about this, for God sends word to you through me, a sinner, that neither Genseric nor any of his will ever see the city of Alexandria, but if you wish to send an army that is a matter for you to decide, the God, whom I adore, will both preserve your piety unhurt and will strengthen those who are sent against the enemies of the empire. Hilasius departed and reported these words to the emperor, and by the grace of God his words come true. Thereupon the emperor returned thanks to God and the holy man, and went up to the ladder and asked his permission to build a lodging for the brethren and for strangers. But the blessed saint opposed the idea saying, Saint Simeon never had any building at all in his enclosure during his lifetime, but I beseech your piety to grant me the request I make of you. The emperor said, I for my part beseech you to do so, command me if you have any wish, to which the holy man replied, I beg you to send men to Antioch, and to bring back the corpse of Saint Simeon. The emperor rejoiced at this request and answered, Do you then give orders for a house to be built where strangers can rest, and a dwelling for the brethren, for I see that with God's help the number of brethren and disciples will increase, and there will be a large crowd of strangers who will be sore put to it if they come up and find no place wherein to lodge. For the blessed Simeon, as you said, did not live in such a storm-beaten place, nor did people go up to him for so many different needs but only to pray and to be blessed, whereas you suffer annoyance in many ways from those who are perplexed over matters of state. Through them I receive many letters from you and rejoice to do so, for they bring me much profit. And so let that come to pass which I wanted when I made my request. Then the blessed Daniel said to the emperor, Since it was for the glory of God and for the protection of brothers and strangers that your piety proposed to do what you suggest, give orders for it to be done. Then the emperor planned that the martyr chapel of Saint Simeon should be placed to the north of the column and be built with piers and vaults but no columns, and the monastery for brothers and strangers should be behind the column. And after prayers had been offered, he returned to the city. While the work was progressing well by the grace of God, the remains of Saint Simeon arrived from the city of Antioch. Being informed of this the emperor ordered the archbishop to announce that the deposition of the holy remains would take place and that there would also be an all-night service in the church of Archangel Michael at Annapolis because the emperor himself was in his palace there. Thus on the following day an imperial carriage was prepared in which the archbishop took his seat and taking the remains with him went up the hill in this fashion, and all the people in untold numbers, some going ahead, and others following, made their way to the appointed place singing psalms and hymns. And many healings took place on that day of the deposition of the holy remains. After the service which followed the whole populace streamed out into the enclosure to the holy man in order to be blessed. And the archbishop with all the clergy went there likewise, and a throne was placed in front of the column, and when the archbishop had taken his seat he said to the holy man, Behold, the Lord has fulfilled all your desires and now bless your children with your counsel. After the deacon had said the letters attend, the holy man from his pillar said to the people, 
Peace be upon you. And then opening his mouth taught them, saying nothing rhetorical or philosophical, but speaking about the love of God and the care of the poor and almsgiving and brotherly love and of the everlasting life which awaits the holy, and the everlasting condemnation which is the lot of sinners. And by the grace of God the hearts of the faithful people were so touched, to the quick that they watered the ground with their tears. After this the Archbishop offered a prayer, and then the holy man dismissed them all, and each man returned to his house in peace. One day a disbelieving heretic came up to the holy man, ostensibly for prayer, with his wife and children and some girls, but instead of prayers he began uttering calumnies against the holy man and poking witticisms at him. And the crowds who were united in their belief in God said to him, What are you doing, man, talking thus foolishly and, instead of praying, hindering us? Why have you come up here? He said to them, I, too, heard from many about this man and came up to be edified, and I found the opposite, for when I approached the column to do obeisance I found this fish lying on the step. And from the inside of his garment he pulled out a very large fried fish, which he had prepared in the market as lunch for himself and his companions, this he showed them, casting blame upon the holy man for being a voluptuary and not temperate. They who saw it first were astonished at his scheme and then, after censuring him severely, they left him alone saying, You will find out what lies you are uttering against the servant of God. And as he was returning to the city, in order that the merciful God might make manifest how he protects his servants, it came to pass that the man himself, as well as his wife and children, began to shiver with ague, then after they had reached the market of the archangel Michael and he wanted to partake of the fish, the wretched fellow was suddenly seized by an unclean spirit, and as he was driven by the demon all round the market he confessed all the deception he had practiced against the holy man. And so, being driven on by the demon, he reached the enclosure with all his friends following him. There they persisted in their repentance and made full confession. Within three days the Lord healed them after they had been given oil of the saints to drink. As thank-offering he dedicated a silver icon, ten pounds in weight, on which was represented the holy man and themselves writing these words below, O Father, beseech God to pardon us our sins against Thee. This memorial is preserved to the present day near the altar. At that time the blessed Emperor Leo heard from many about a certain Titus, a man of vigour who dwelt in Gaul and had in his service a number of men well trained for battle, so he sent for him and honoured him with the rank of count that he might have him to fight on his behalf if he were forced to go to year. This Titus he sent to the holy man for his blessing, on his arrival the saint watered him with many and divers counsels from the holy writings and proved him to be an ever-blooming fruit-bearing tree, and Titus, beholding the holy man, marvelled at the strangeness of his appearance and his endurance and just as good earth when it, has received the rain brings forth much fruit. So this admirable man Titus was illuminated in mind by the teaching of the holy and just man and no longer wished to leave the enclosure, for he said, The whole labour of man is spent on growing rich and acquiring possessions in this world and pleasing men, yet the single hour of his death robs him of all his belongings, therefore it is better for us to serve God rather than men. With these words he threw himself down before the holy man begging him to receive him and let him be enrolled in the brotherhood. And Daniel, the servant of the Lord, willingly accepted his good resolve. Thereupon that noble man Titus sent for all his men and said to his soldiers, From now on I am the soldier of the heavenly king, aforetime my rank among men made me your captain and yet I was unable to benefit either you or myself, for I only urged you on to slaughter and bloodshed. From today, however, and henceforth I bid farewell to all such things, therefore those of you who wish it, remain here with me, but I do not compel any one of you, for what is done under compulsion is not acceptable. See, here is money, take some, each of you, and go to your homes? Then he brought much gold and he took and placed it in front of the column and gave to each according to his rank. Two of them, however, did not choose to take any, but remained with him. All the rest embraced Titus and went their ways. When the emperor heard this he was very angry and sent a messenger up to the holy man to say to Titus, 
I brought you up from your country because I wanted to have you quite near me and I sent you to the holy man to pray and receive a blessing, but not that you should separate yourself from me. Titus replied to the messenger, From now on, since I have listened to the teaching of this holy man, I am dead to the world and to all the things of the world. Whatever the just man says about me do you tell the emperor, for Titus, your servant, is dead. Then the messengers went outside into the enclosure to the holy man and told him everything. And the holy man sent a letter of counsel by them to the emperor, beseeching him and saying, You yourself need no human aid, for owing to your perfect faith in God you have God as your everlasting defender, do not therefore covet a man who today is and tomorrow is not, for the Lord doeth all things according to his will. Therefore dedicate thy servant to God who is able to send your piety in his stead another still braver and more useful, without your approval I never wished to do anything. And the emperor was satisfied and sent and thanked the holy man and said, To crown all your good deeds there yet remained this good thing for you to do. Let the man, then, remain under your authority, and may God accept his good purpose. Not long afterwards they were deemed worthy of the holy robe, and both made progress in the good way of life, but more especially was this true of Titus, the former count. Next the devil, the hinderer of good men, imbued Titus with a spirit of inquisitiveness and suggested that he should watch the holy man in order to see if he ate and what he took to eat. So one day he waited till about the time of lamplighting and then unnoticed by all the brethren he remained outside in the enclosure hidden behind the column. When the nightly psalmody took place in the oratory the brothers imagined he had stayed behind because he was sick. The following day, he spent with all the others. Although he did the same thing for seven nights, he found out nothing. Finally he openly conjured the holy man to explain his manner of life to him. And the holy man granted him his wish saying, Believe me, brother, I both eat and drink sufficiently for my needs, for I am not a spirit nor disembodied, but I too am a man and am clothed with flesh. And the business of evacuation I perform like a sheep exceedingly dryly, and if ever I am tempted to partake of more than I require, I punish myself, for I am unable either to walk about or to relieve myself to aid my digestion, therefore in proportion as I struggle to be temperate, to that degree I benefit and the pain in my feet becomes less intense. Titus answered, If you, your holiness, who are in such a state of body and standing in such a wind-swept spot, struggle in that manner to be temperate for your own good, what ought I to do who am young in years and vigorous in body? The saint replied, Do whatever your flesh can endure, neither force it beyond measure nor on the other hand abandon it to slackness, for if you load a ship beyond its usual burden, it will readily be sunk by its weight, but if on the contrary you leave it too light, it is easily overturned by the winds. By the grace of God, brother, I understand my natural capacity, and know how to regulate my food. After hearing this Titus went away to the oratory, took his place in one corner and hung himself up by ropes under his armpits, so that his feet did not rest upon the ground, and from one evening to another he would eat either three dates or three dried figs and drink the ration of wine. He also fixed a ball against his chest on which he would sometimes lay his head and sleep and at others place a book and read. And he did this for some long time and benefited all those who visited him, amongst these was the most faithful emperor, Leo, for whenever he went up to the holy man, after taking leave of him, he would go in to the blessed Titus, and beholding his inspired manner of life he marvelled at this endurance and besought him to pray for him and it pleased the Lord to call him while he was at prayer, with his eyes and his face turned upwards and heavenwards, and thus it was that he breathed his last. The brethren looking at him thought he was praying as usual. When evening had fallen, the two brethren came who had formerly been his servants and now ministered unto him and brought him all he required, and they discovered that he was dead. And when they began to lament all recognized that he had gone to his rest his head lay back on his neck, his hands were crossed and supported by the plank and since the weight of the body was borne by the shoulder ropes his legs hung down straight and were not bent up. And as one looked on the corpse of this saintly champion it showed the departed soul's longing for God. The brethren went, 
and told the elders who came out to the holy man's enclosure and announced to him the death of the glorious saint. When he heard of it he thanked the Lord and bade them carry out the corpse to him after the time of lamplighting and put it in front of the column and hold an all-night service there in his memory. The next day Titus was buried in the tomb of the elders by command of the holy man. After Titus had died this holy death, one of the barbarians who had come with him, and had been named Anatolius by the holy man aspired to the same kind of life in the same place, and conducting himself blamelessly therein for a long time, he greatly benefited all those who visited him. Thus his fame spread on every side. As he wished to flee from glory among men he went out at night into the enclosure to the holy man and fell down before him imploring him to grant him his permission. The holy man inquired the reason and, on hearing it, prayed over him and dismissed him. After receiving his dismissal Anatolius travelled to the chapel of St. Zacharias in Catabolus, and took up his dwelling there in a suburb on the opposite shore, at that time Ida Bingo's was general. Shutting himself up in a small cell, he lived in it for a long time, later he established a small monastery of about twelve men, which by the grace of God and the prayers of the Holy Father is still in existence today, thus in blessedness he passed away to the Lord. About that time the pious Emperor Leo married his daughter Ariadne to Zeno, of whom we have spoken before, and also created him consul. And shortly afterwards when the barbarians created a disturbance in Thrace, he further appointed him commander-in-chief in Thrace. And in solemn procession he went up to Anaplus to the holy man and besought him as follows, I am sending Zeno as general to Thrace because of the war which threatens, and now I beg you to pray on his behalf that he may be kept safe. The holy man said to the emperor, as he has the holy trinity, and the invincible weapon of the holy cross on his side he will return unharmed. However, a plot will be formed against him and he will be sorely troubled for a short time, but he shall come back without injury. The emperor said, Is it possible, I beg you, for anyone to survive a war without some labor and trouble? When they had received a blessing and taken their leave they returned to the city. Then the aforesaid Zeno set out for the war and soon afterwards a plot was formed against him as the holy man had foretold, but by God's assistance he escaped and reached the long wall and crossed from there and came to Pili, and later still he reached the city of the Chalcedonians. Now while the patrician Zeno was still absent at the war a male child was born to him, by the emperor's daughter and received the name of Leo. When Aspar and his sons stirred up a rebellion against the most pious emperor Leo, he that maketh wars to cease unto the ends of the earth fought on the side of the pious emperor and destroyed them both. After that Leo crowned his own grandson and namesake, emperor. And thus it came to pass that Zeno took courage and crossed from Chalcedon to the city and entered the palace and came to the emperor Leo. As time went on it befell that the pious Emperor Leo the Great fell sick and died, he made a good end and left as successor to the throne his own grandson Leo, son of the patrician Zeno. Then the Senate convoked a meeting because the Emperor was an infant and unable to sign documents, and they determined that his father Zeno should hold the scepter of the Empire. And thus he was crowned and became Emperor. After three years had passed the Lord took the infant, the pious Emperor Leo, into his eternal kingdom, and he went to the land of his fathers, and left the empire to his father. The Roman government was being well administered by the will of God, and the state was enjoying a time of quiet and order, and the holy churches were living in peace and unity, when the ever envious and malignant devil sowed seeds of unjust hatred in the hearts of some who claimed to be the Emperor Zeno's kinsmen, I mean Basiliscus, Armatus and Marcianus and some other senators. When Zeno became aware of the treachery that was being planned against him, he went up to the holy man and confided to him the matter of the plot. The holy man said to him, Do not let yourself be troubled about this, for all things that have been foreordained must be accomplished upon you. They will chase you out of the kingdom, and in the place where you find a refuge, you will be in such distress that in your need you will partake of the grass of the earth. But do not lose heart, for it is necessary that you should become a second Nebuchadnezzar, and those who are now expelling you, having felt the lack of you, will recall you in the fullness of time. 
you will return to your empire, and more honour and glory shall be added unto you and you shall die in it. Therefore bear all with gratitude, for thus must these things be. The emperor thanked him for these words, for he had already put him to the test in the case of other prophecies of his, and after being blessed by the holy man he took his leave and went down to the city. Now the malicious men whom I mentioned above had free access to the blessed Empress Verena, Basiliscus because he was her brother and chief of the senate, and Armatus as being her nephew and Zuzus as being the husband of her sister, and Marcianus the husband of her daughter and son of an emperor. They were constantly at her side and by their guile persuaded her to conspire with them to drive Zeno from the throne. As he knew of their wickedness and that he was in danger of assassination, he took his own wife, the Empress Ariadne, and some eunuchs, and unbeknown to all he left the palace one night during a very heavy storm. They crossed the straits and landed at Chalcedon because of their pursuers, and they escaped and reached the province of Isauria. The Empress Verena so controlled the revolution that she secured the crown for her brother Basiliscus, who shortly afterwards attempted to do away with his own sister. However, she fled to the oratory of the ever-Virgin Mary in Blachany and remained there as long as Basiliscus lived. Next Basiliscus name of Iloman made an attack upon the churches of God, for he wished to bring them to deny the incarnate dispensation of God. For this reason he came into conflict with the blessed Archbishop Acacius, and sought to malign him so as to bring about his ruin. Directly news of this attempt reached the monasteries all the monks with one accord assembled in the most holy great church in order to guard the archbishop. After some consideration the archbishop ordered all the churches to be draped as a sign of mourning, and going up into the pulpit he addressed the crowds and explained the blasphemous attempt which was being made. Brethren and children, he said, the time of martyrdom is at hand, let us therefore fight for our faith and for the holy church, our mother, and let us not betray our priesthood. A great shout arose and all were overcome by tears, and since the emperor remained hostile and refused to give them any answer, the archbishop and the archimandrites determined, to send to the holy man, Daniel, and give him an account of these things, and this they did. And it happened by God's providence that on the following day Basiliscus sailed to Annapolis, and sent a chamberlain named Daniel, to the holy man to say, do those things which the Archbishop Acacius is practising against me seem just to your angelic nature. For he has roused the city against me and alienated the army and rains insults on me. I beg you, pray for us that he may not prevail against us. After listening to him the holy man said to Daniel, Go and tell him who sent you, you are not worthy of a blessing for you have adopted Jewish ideas and are setting at naught the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ and upsetting the Holy Church and despising his priests. For it is written Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine. Know therefore and see, for the God who rendeth swiftly will surely rend your tyrannous royalty out of your hands. When the Chamberlain heard this answer he said he dared not himself say these things to the Emperor and besought Daniel to send the message in writing, if he would, and to seal it with his seal. The holy man yielded to the eunuch's entreaties, wrote a note and after sealing it, gave it to Daniel and dismissed him, and he returned and delivered the sealed note to the Emperor. He opened it and when he learnt the purport of the message he was very angry and immediately sailed back to the city. These things were not hidden from the Archbishop Acacius and his most faithful people, therefore on the following day almost the whole city was gathered together in the great church and they kept shouting, The holy man for the church. Let the new Daniel save Susanna in her peril. Another Elijah shall put Jezebel and Ahab to shame. In you we have the priest of orthodoxy, he that standeth for Christ will protect his bride, the church and other such exclamations they poured forth with tears. On the morrow the Archbishop Acacius sent to Daniel some of the Archimandrites who were best beloved of God, these were the blessed Abramius of the monastery of St. Chiacus, Eusebius who dwelt near the Exarchionium Athenodorus of the monastery of Studius and Andreas, the vicar of the Exarch, and some others. Having chosen these he sent them saying, For my sake and the faiths go to the holy man Daniel, Throw yourselves before his column and importune him with entreaties saying, 
Do you imitate your teacher Christ who bowed the heavens and came down, and was incarnate of a holy virgin and consorted with sinners and shed his own blood to purchase his bride, the Church? Now that she is insulted by the impious, and her people are scattered by fierce walls and the shepherd tempest toast, do not ignore my grey hairs but incline your ear and come and purchase your mother, the Church. And they went and did as they were bid and threw themselves down before the column, and the holy man seeing them lying on the ground was disturbed and began to call to them from above, What are you doing, holy fathers, mocking my unworthiness? What is it that you bid me do? Then they stood up and said, That you with God's help should save the faith, which is being persecuted, save a storm-tossed church and a scattered flock, and save our priests who, despite his grey hairs, is threatened with death. And Daniel said to them, He is truthful that said, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the holy church, wait patiently therefore where you are and the will of God shall be done, pray then that God may reveal to us what we should do. And it came to pass that as Daniel was praying in the middle of the night, and as the day dawned it was a Wednesday he heard a voice saying distinctly to him, Go down with the fathers and do not hesitate, and afterwards fulfill your course in peace. Obedient therefore to the counsel of the Lord he woke his servants. And they placed the ladder and went up and took away the iron bars round him. And Daniel came down with difficulty owing to the pain he suffered in his feet, and in that same hour of the night he took the pious Archimandrites with him, and they sailed to the city and entered the church before the day had begun. And thus it was that when the people came to God's house while, according to custom, the fiftieth psalm was being sung, they saw the holy man in the sanctuary with the bishop and marvelled, and the report ran through the city that he had come. All the city, and even secluded maidens, left what they had in hand and ran to the holy church to see the man of God. And the crowds started shouting in honour of the saints saying, To you we look to banish the grief of the church, in you we have a high priest, accomplish that for which you came, the crown of your labours is already yours. But the holy man beckoned with his hand to the people to be silent and addressed them through the deacon, Theoctistus, the stretching forth of the hands of Moses, God's servant, utterly destroyed all those who rose up against the Lord's people, both kings and nations, some he drowned in the depths of the sea, others he slew on dry land with the sword and exalted his people, so today, too, your faith which is perfect towards God has not feared the uprising of your enemies. It does not know defeat nor does it need human help, for it is founded on the firm rock of Christ. Therefore do not grow weary of praying, for even on behalf of the chief of the apostles earnest prayer was offered to God, not as if they thought he was deserted by God but because God wishes the flock to offer intercessions for its shepherd. Do you, therefore, do likewise, and amongst us, too, the Lord will quickly perform marvellous things to his glory. After he had said this they took down all the morning draperies from the sanctuary and the whole church. Daniel also wrote a letter to the emperor saying, Does this angering of God do you any service? Is not your life in his hands? What have you to do with the holy church to war against its servants, and prove yourself a second Diocletian? And many other things like these he wrote both by way of counsel and of blame. When the emperor received the letter and found that Daniel had come down and was in the church he was stung by the prick of fear and sent back word to him, all your endeavour has been to enter the city and stir up the citizens against me, now see, I will hand the city, too, over to you. And he left the palace and sailed to the Hebdomen. When the holy man heard this news, he took the cross-bearers and the faithful people and bidding the monks guard the church and the archbishop he went out. As they reached Ami, close to the chapel of the prophet the holy Samuel, the just man being carried by the crowd of the Christ-loving people, behold, a leper approached and cried aloud saying, I beseech you, the servant of the God who healed lepers, to pray him that I may be healed. On hearing him the holy man ordered his bearers to halt, and when the leper had drawn near, the holy man said to him, Brother, how came you to think of asking me things that are beyond my power? For I, too, am a man encompassed with weakness even as you are. The leper replied, But I beg you, I know that you are a man of God, and I believe that the God whom you serve will grant me cleansing in answer to your prayers, 
for the apostles too were but men and yet through their prayers the Lord healed many. The holy man marvelling at his faith said to him, Do you then believe in him who gave healing to many through his saints? The leper said, Yes, and I believe that even now if you pray I shall be healed. Then Daniel turning to the east asked the people to stretch forth their hands to heaven and with tears to cry aloud the Lord, Have mercy. And when he deemed that they had done this long enough, he said to the men near him, In the name of Jesus Christ, who cleansed lepers, take him and wash him in the sea and wipe him clean and bring him back. They ran off with the man, washed him in the scar and by the power of Jesus Christ the leper was healed on the spot. When the multitudes saw this astonishing miracle they shouted unceasingly the Kyrie Ellison. Then the crowds took the man that was healed, all naked as he was, and returned to the city and brought him into the holy church and leading him up to the pulpit declared this wondrous miracle to all. The whole city ran together and beholding him who had been a leper cleansed by God through the holy man's prayers they glorified God for making the leper spotless. And so all those in the city who had sick folk ran to the servant of God. And the Lord gave healing abundantly to them all. Thereafter as the holy man with the crowd approached the palace of Hebrewman, a goth leant out of a window and seeing the holy man carried along, he dissolved with laughter and shouted, see here is our new consul. And as soon as he said this he was hurled down from the height by the power of God and burst asunder. Then sentinels, or the palace guards, prevented those who had seen the fall from entering into the palace, saying they should have an answer given them through a window. But when the people insisted with shouts that the holy man should enter the palace but received no answer, the servant of God said to them, Why do you trouble, children? You shall have the reward promised to peacemakers from God, and since it seems good to this braggart to send us away without achieving anything, let us do to him according to the word of the Lord. For he said to his holy disciples and apostles, Into whatsoever city or village ye shall enter and they do not receive you, shake off the dust of your feet against them as a testimony to them, let us therefore do that. And he first of all shook out his leather tunic and incited the whole crowd to do likewise, and a noise as of thunder arose from the shaking of garments. When the guards who were on duty saw this and heard all the marvellous things God had wrought by Daniel most of them left all and followed him. When the impious Basiliscus heard what the holy man had done in condemnation of him, he sent two guardsmen of the court and a legal secretary of the emperor with them to overtake Daniel and implore him to return. These men overtook Daniel and implored him in the name of Basiliscus saying the emperor says if I indeed sinned as a man, do you as servant of Christ propitiate him on my behalf and I will seek in everything to serve God and your holiness. But the holy man said to them, Return and say to the emperor, Your words of guile and deceit will not avail to deceive my unworthiness, for you are doing nothing but treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, for in you there is no fruit of good works, wherefore God will shortly confirm his wrath upon you that you may know that the Most High ruleth over the kingdom of men and will give it to the good man in preference to you. With these words he bade the emperor's secretary to spread out his cloak and after shaking the rest of the dust from his own clothing into the cloak he said, Go, carry this to the braggart as a testimony against him and against her who is his confederate and against his wife directly after the messengers had returned and given the emperor the just man's answer, the tower of the palace fell since even lifeless things may feel the wrath of God to the salvation of many. When the just man had arrived at the golden gate and saw the concourse of people, he besought them to return each to their own home. But they as with one voice cried, We intend to live and die with you, for we have nothing with which to repay you worthily, receive the resolve of your suppliants and lead us as you will, for the holy church awaits you. Whilst the people were uttering these cries two young men afflicted with demons were brought to him, and after he had prayed with tears to God, they were immediately cleansed and they followed him glorifying God. When they came to the chapel of St. John in the monastery of Studius the monks came out and requested the holy man to come in and offer prayer in their prophet's shrine and to rest a little from the thronging press which encompassed him. When he consented to come in and offer prayer there was such a crush of people in the narrow passages that many only narrowly escaped being trodden to death. Then after Daniel had offered prayer in the venerable shrine and passed through to the sacristy he and the men who carried him, 
had a short rest. And the monks had the idea of taking him through the garden to the sea and bringing him by boat to the great and very holy church. When the people got wind of this, a great tumult arose among them and they shouted and said, Bring the just man here if you love orthodoxy, do not begrudge healing to the sick. They also said to the just man, Freely you have received therefore freely give. If you desert us we will burn down the chapel at once. So the holy man came out of the sacristy and addressed them, reassuring them and asking them to go on ahead of him and thus relieve the pressure of the crowd. When Daniel came out of the prophet's shrine and was going on his way, behold, a certain woman, as did the woman of Canaan, cried to him saying, O servant of God, have pity on my daughter, for she whom you see has now been bedridden for three years in the grip of an unknown disease, and though many doctors have visited her, not one of them has been able to help her. So now I beseech you, O holy man, do not despise my tears for I am sorely distressed about her. Seeing her in such terrible grief, the holy man was dissolved in tears, and raising his eyes to heaven and stretching out his hands to God he prayed, and then calling the girl close to him he sealed her with the sign of the precious cross and said to her, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ whoever worketh our salvation and does not desert us, be thou cured of this disease. And the girl was cured of her scourge in that hour in the sight of all the people. When they drew nigh to the house of the most glorious patrician de Galaphus, the patrician himself leaned out from an upper window and seeing that the holy man was being unbearably crushed by the thronging crowd, he ran down with a body of helpers and took him out of the crush and caused him to be carried into his house near the forum of the ox to rest there. He himself stood in the porch and excused himself to the people by saying, I did this in order that my house might be blessed. And he put Daniel into a litter and secured him well by posting men round the litter to prevent his being troubled by the crowd. And in this manner he was brought in safety to the church without any difficulty. When he entered into the most holy cathedral he was received in great sincerity and with acclamation by the Archbishop Acacius and the holy Archimandrites and all the reverend clergy and the most pious monks and the most faithful people and all glorified the merciful God for the marvellous things that they had heard and seen which God had done through him. And they led him into the vestry that he might have a short rest from the pressure of the crowd. And behold a snake came out from some hole and wound itself round his feet, those present were terrified on seeing the animal and ran forward to kill it, but the holy man prevented them saying, Leave it alone, it is near its end and shaking it off his feet he said to it go to thy place. And it went to the wall opposite them, and in the sight of all of them it burst in pieces. The patrician her eyes hearing that he was in the vestry came in, threw herself on the ground and seized the holy man's feet, begging him that she might have a son. But when she saw that on the one foot the sole had dropped away from the ankle bone and there was nothing left but the shin bone she was amazed at the man's endurance. She gave him a little cord and begged him to wind it round his inflamed foot and give it to her. But he would not suffer this to be done. Then the Archbishop Acacius and all the pious men present besought the holy man to grant her what she asked. Then the holy man consented, took the cord and placed it on his inflamed foot and gave it to her saying, According to thy faith may the Lord grant thee thy request for a son, and his name shall be Zeno. And it came to pass that soon afterwards this most noble woman conceived and bore a son and called him by the name of Zeno according to the word of the saint. When all these things had been thus auspiciously accomplished by the grace of the Lord, and when Basiliscus of Illomand name had heard from his legal secretary of the saint's condemnation of him and of the sudden fall of the palace tower, it did not seem to him to augur any good. And immediately without a moment's delay he entered a boat and sailed from the Hebumen to the city, and the next day he sent senators to the very holy cathedral to beseech the saint, to take the trouble to come as far as the palace. But he would not consent to go but said, Let him come himself to the holy church and make his recantation before the precious cross and the holy gospel which he has insulted, for I am but a sinful man. The senators went back and gave this message to the emperor, whereupon in solemn procession he at once went to the church. The archbishop met him with the holy gospel in the sanctuary and was received by the emperor with dissimulation, 
Then after the customary prayer had been offered Basiliscus went in with the archbishop to the holy man. And they both fell at his feet before all the people, both Basiliscus and the archbishop Acacius. And Daniel greeted them and counselled them to seek the way of peace and for the future to refrain from enmity towards each other. For if you are at variance, he said, you cause confusion in the holy churches and throughout the world you stir up no ordinary unrest. The emperor then made a full apology to the holy man that the people cried out saying, O Lord, protect both father and sons, it is in thy power to grant us concord between them, let us now hear the emperor's confession of faith. Why are the canons of orthodoxy upset? Why are the orthodox bishops exiled? To the stadium with Theoptistus, the master of the offices. The emperor is orthodox. Burn alive the enemies of orthodoxy. Send the disturbers of the world into exile. A Christian emperor for the world. Let us hear what your faith is, emperor. These and countless other exclamations the people kept shouting, and all the time the emperor and the archbishop lay prostrate on the ground at the holy man's feet. Then the holy man summoned Strategius, the imperial secretary, and bade the emperor make a proclamation to the people by way of justification, and this he did. And the secretary mounted the pulpit and began to read as follows, We believe that your reverence is perfect in understanding as you are cannot fail to know that from infancy up we have been orthodox and have communicated in the very holy church in which our children were baptized, and that we believe in the one holy and consubstantial trinity, and we approve your warm championship of the faith. Do not, therefore, accept any childish insinuation against us from those who say that we do not think rightly concerning the holy faith. For you know yourselves that we who are soldiers brought up and trained to arms are not able to understand the depths of the holy faith, but since it is now a time for peace and no season for controversy, I can pass over many things, since we are able completely to convince you, our beloved subjects, that we shall not be found guilty of a single one of those charges which men in their fickleness plotted to bring against us. This is our justification before God, and the holy man and we have stated it clearly to you. Having in this way appeased the holy man and the people, the emperor was reconciled to them. And having been reconciled to the archbishop in the sight of them all the emperor returned to his palace. Thus did our master God bring the enemy of his holy church to his feet. When all minds were set at rest and the people were moving off to their own homes the servant of God returned to his usual practice of asceticism, but when he had sailed back he reached his column only with difficulty owing to the press of faithful people and of those overmastered by divers' illnesses. Therefore with great danger and much distress he made the ascent of his column and summoned them all, and after praying to God he dismissed them all restored to health. To the clergy and monks and the people who had remained behind he said, it was not with honesty of purpose that the persecutor appeared to make peace with us, be patient therefore and you will soon see the glory of God, for the Lord will not overlook the affliction of his servants and his holy churches. And thus it was accomplished by the will of God, for after a short time Zeno, the emperor, returned with his wife, the empress Ariadne, the daughter of royal parents. Thenceforth the holy churches rested in much contentment and the state grew glorious and the Roman government waxed in strength. And the aforesaid usurper met with his due reward, as the servant of God had foretold. And thereafter the emperor often went up to the holy man returning thanks to the merciful God, and also to the saint, reminding him of the things which he had foretold should happen. Once a goldsmith came up from the city to the holy man with his wife and they brought with them their seven-year-old child who had never walked from birth but spent his life crawling along. This goldsmith came to the holy man and throwing himself and his child in front of the column, he besought the holy man saying, O servant of God, have pity on my young child who longs to stand up but cannot do so, for nature conceived him contrary to nature, grant me this joy, O servant of God for I have followed your holy footsteps, do not send me away, I pray you, with my petition unfulfilled. The holy man replied, Do not be so impatient in your words, for your zeal towards God, if accompanied by faith and patience, will release your son from his calamity, do not be discouraged but go with the child and remain by the holy relics of Simeon, the holy servant of God and our father, 
anoint the child's feet with the holy oil and bring him back here when prayer is being offered, and we trust in God that he will give him healing. The man did as the holy man had ordered him, and on the seventh day, when prayer had been offered in the enclosure, the boy suddenly jumped onto the steps of the pillar and went up and embraced the column, all marveled and glorified God for this wonderful happenings and his parents gave thanks to God and to the holy man and took the boy home in health. When the boy grew to be a man he frequently visited the holy man, received a blessing and returned home. A certain man travelling to Constantinople from the east fell among robbers who stole from him everything that he had with him, mutilated his body, cut the sinews of his knees and leaving him half dead, went their ways, but by the providence of God they had not inflicted any mortal wound on him. Some wayfarers who came to that place picked him up and carried him to the city of Ankara, for it was close to that city that this had befallen him. There they took him to the bishop who ordered him to be conveyed to the hospital and cared for there. But while his wounds were tended he was not able to walk. He therefore made this request of the bishop, I was travelling to Constantinople in fulfilment of a vow making my way to our Lord Daniel, who stands on the column, when I met with this accident, and now that, thanks to you, I have been healed it behoves me to fulfil my vow. I pray you, therefore, servant of God, to send me safely to Constantinople to the holy man the bishop, since he thought that this was a pious request, gave him money for his expenses, also a beast and two men to conduct him to the holy man Daniel. So the men took him and brought him to the holy man's enclosure and then carried him and laid him in front of the column. The man cried aloud and told the holy man the reason for which he had come and related what had happened to him and how he had been saved by the help of God and the bishop. The holy man sent thanks to the bishop for the kindness he had shown to the man and after furnishing those who had brought him with supplies for their journey he dismissed them in peace with presents for the bishop. He handed over the man to some of the servants with orders to carry him and bring him to the enclosure daily at the hour of prayer, and to anoint him with the oil of the saints, the man's legs hung down as if they did not belong to him. After a few days, one Friday when the saint had said the prayers as usual and all had said Amen, the man suddenly leapt from the litter, and stood on his feet and said with a loud voice, Bless me, O servant of God. And he quickly ran up the steps and embraced the column giving thanks the while to God. Here I think it would be reasonable to make known the faith which lay hidden in Hippasius, the second centurion. This man was so rich in the great poverty of Christ that the cures performed by Christ's disciples he accepted as though wrought by the Lord himself, for if any one of his house, be it son or daughter or manservant or maidservant, fell ill or suffered from anything, he judged himself unworthy to seek the intercession of the saint, but would send letters asking for the saint's prayers. On receiving the holy man's written reply he would lay the letter, as if it were the miracle working hand of Jesus, on the sufferer and immediately he received the fruits of his faith. A certain woman had a son of twelve years, Damianus by name, dumb from birth, him she brought to the holy man's enclosure and signing to him not to go away, she left him and departed. Then when the brethren saw the boy staying there and saying nothing to anybody, they brought him to the holy man. He, beholding him, ordered that he should remain in the monastery, saying, the boy shall be God's minister. The brethren said, He is dumb, master. He said to them, Moisten his tongue with the oil of the saints. But the brethren suspected that from stress of poverty the mother had suggested to him to feign dumbness, so very often when the boy was asleep they woke him suddenly by making a noise, and at other times they would prick him in the body with needles or pens to try whether he would speak. But he said nothing, as he was held by the power of dumbness. One Sunday, after some considerable time had passed, when the Holy Gospel was going to be read aloud, and the deacon had announced the lesson from the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew, the boy shouted out ahead of the others, Glory be to thee, O Lord! And after uttering this first cry he in future surpassed all the brethren in his singing of the Psalms. A certain chamberlain, Calipodius by name, had built an oratory to the holy archangel Michael and came to the holy man asking him to give him some brethren for this oratory in Parthenopolis. And together with the brethren the holy man gave him this boy to sing the psalms and he became God's minister, 
as the servant of God had foretold about him. So great are the achievements of grace, so great the gifts of our Master to his sincere servants, he came not speaking and became a good speaker, he came voiceless and gained a beautiful voice, he was deserted by his mother as dumb and he proved to be the wonderful herald of the Church. Many other marvellous works, too were performed by God through his servant Daniel which neither words can describe nor tongue relate, these we must of necessity omit so as not to prolong our story unduly, for those we have told are sufficient to confirm the faithful, and to lead the faithless to turn to the faith. But let us attempt to describe how resolute, and inflexible was the faith of the holy man. Through the devil's working a tumult once arose in the most holy churches, for Tess had sprung up from vain disputations and questionings, so that some of the monks, who were renowned for good living, through their simple-mindedness and through their failure to consider the matter with precision, left the Most Holy Church and separated themselves from the Holy Fellowship and Liturgy. These mischief-makers came to the Holy Man and tried to confound him with similar arguments, but he who kept the foundation of the Holy Faith unmovable, and unshakable answered them saying, If the question which you raise is concerning God, your inquiry is no simple or ordinary matter, for the divinity is incomprehensible. And it will be sufficient for you to study the traditions of the holy apostles about him and the teaching of the divine fathers who followed in their steps and not trouble yourselves any further. But if the matter in dispute is about human affairs, as, for instance, if one priest has removed another, or has accepted one to whom the others object, all such things must be submitted to the judgment of God, and to the rulers themselves to judge according to the divine canons, for we are the sheep and they are the shepherds, and they will give account to God for the flocks entrusted to them. Let us abstain from vain and dangerous questionings and let us each consider that which concerns ourselves knowing that it is not without danger that we separate ourselves from our Holy Mother, the Church. For her bridegroom is the true shepherd who is able to recall to his fold the sheep that have strayed and to lead those who have not strayed to better pasture. Therefore it suffices us to believe unquestioningly in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and to receive the incarnate dispensation of our Lord Jesus Christ and his birth from the Virgin in the same way as he himself was pleased to do in his own loving kindness, for it is written, Seek not out the things that are too high for thee, neither search the things that are too deep for thee. With this and similar counsel and warning he led their hearts away from soul-destroying questionings and kept them unshaken in the faith. He also foresaw the death of the Emperor Zeno and this he made known to him through one of those who often came to visit him, first by ambiguous messages, and then later he warned him clearly that he would receive the recompense for his good and evil deeds. He told Zeno that owing to his faith in God and his good deeds he might have full confidence when he came into the presence of God, but he must be mindful to abstain from all covetousness, and he must excel in the good ordering of his life and banish all informers and treat with generosity all those who had sinned against him, for by nothing is God better pleased than by forgiveness and gentleness. These things he said before Zeno's death, and to us he foretold that after her husband's death the Christ-loving Ariadne would reign over the empire because of her perfect faith in the God of her fathers, and that with her would reign a man who loved Christ and had devoted his whole life to hymns to God and to vigils, who was a model of sobriety to all men and who in gentleness and justice would surpass all those who had reigned at any time, he will turn aside, too, he said, from that love of money which according to the apostle is the root of all evil. He will govern the state impartially and honestly, and throughout his reign he will grant peace and confidence to the most holy churches and to the order of monks. In his time the rich shall not be favoured, neither shall the poor be wronged, for this above all, both in peace and in war, will be the surest guarantee of prosperity to the world. All these predictions were confirmed shortly afterwards, for when Anastasius had been elected emperor, his acts in themselves were sufficient proof to the world that the saints' prophecies had been fulfilled, and those who dwelt in the holy man's enclosure realized this more especially since they received all manner of benefits. During the holy man's first illness, from which he was expected to die, the pious sovereigns of whom I have spoken moved by divine zeal, displayed great eagerness to honor his memory, for they brought from the capital a very large tomb of precious stone and splendid metal work which can be seen to this day in the consecrated enclosure, a very wonderful sight for visitors and of surpassing lavishness, 
and whatever was needed for the funeral they supplied with the greatest generosity. And it is superfluous to mention the munificence of the liberality of the pious sovereigns and their unfailing protection. This devotion to the saint which was so fruitful and a fountain of kindly deeds the servant of God heard of after his recovery and said, All these acts are truly great and worthy of their faith in God and sufficient to call down the goodwill from above upon them, but a resting place of stone and one so distinguished does not befit me, for I desire the earth only according to God's command, dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. The rulers will receive a far greater recompense from God, but I myself wish to be buried deep down in the earth and have the remains of holy martyrs laid above me, so that, if anyone should wish to visit my resting place to strengthen his faith, he may pay his reverence to the saints and from them receive the reward of his good deeds and free himself from condemnation. This wish we carried out according to his orders after his second illness and actual translation. For above his revered grave lie the relics of the three holy children, Ananias, Azarias, and Misael. These were brought from Babylon by the Emperor Leo of pious memory during the lifetime of the holy man, and were deposited by Euphemius, the most holy archbishop of the imperial city, who outrivaled all others in his zeal for showing honour to the holy man, so we did not experience any feeling of separation from our blessed and glorious father. And at the moment of Daniel's blessed death the sovereigns increased their gifts, for they bought tens of thousands of candles and illuminated both the oratories, and beginning at the very top of the column they filled with candles all the spiral scaffolding built for the descent of the holy corpse. So great a grace of prophecy was granted to this holy man that three months before his falling asleep he foretold to us that within a few days he would quit the dwelling of his body and go to dwell with the Lord. And from that time on he did not converse with those that resorted to him about present-day matters only, but by foreknowledge he also announced future events to them, strengthening them with words of good counsel, and he gave injunctions to his usual attendants and to us how his precious body was to be brought down from the column. And in every instance in which we obeyed him things turned out propitiously for us, but if perchance we did anything contrary to his command, or as we thought fit, being satisfied with our human planning, it was sure to turn out contrarywise for us, for he had been deemed worthy by God of the prophetic gift. And as he had been granted this wonderful grace the glorious man also told us beforehand of her eyes, the servant of God, and said that moved by spiritual zeal she would not allow his holy body to be brought down except by the means she herself would provide, and he warned us that nobody should oppose her in this intention, and this, too, came to pass. For this most noble servant of God, her eyes, generous as ever, made lavish provision for the funeral of our thrice-blessed father Daniel supplying an abundance of candles and oil beyond measure and gold for distribution to the poor and a great quantity of wood. And she ordered a number of men who were experienced in such works to erect a structure spiral-wise round the column and about the entrance to the oratory where the much-enduring body of the noble champion of the ascetic life was to lie, so that it might not be injured by the onrush of the crowd trying to snatch a relic. And according to the command of the holy man nobody hindered her in this pious purpose. Seven days before his falling asleep he summoned the whole brotherhood, from chiefest to least, and some he bade stand quite near him on the top of the ladder and listen to his words. When he knew they were assembled, he said, My brothers and children, behold, I am going to our Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. God who created all things by his word and wisdom, both the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is who brought the race of men into being from that which was not, he who is terrible to the angels but good to men, who bowed the heavens and came down upon the earth like rain upon the mown grass, upon the holy Virgin Mary, the mother of God, and was pleased to be incarnate of her, as he alone understands, and to be seen by men upon earth, who took away the sins of the world and suffered for us, and with his stripes upon the cross healed our spiritual wounds, and nailed the bond that was against us to the wood of the cross, he will strengthen you and will guard you safe from evil and will keep your faith in him firm and immovable if you continue in unity with each other and perfect love until you draw your last breath. May he give you grace to serve him blamelessly and to be one body and one spirit continuing in humility and obedience. Do not neglect hospitality, never separate yourselves from your holy mother, the church, 
turn away from all causes of offense and the tears of heretics, who are the enemies of Christ, in order that ye may become perfect even as also your heavenly Father is perfect. And now, I bid you farewell, my beloved children, and I embrace you all with the love of a Father, the Lord will be with you. These words he ordered to be read aloud to the brethren by those who had stood nearest to him and caught the words, for he was lying down. When this had been done, and the brethren had heard the Holy Father's prayer and farewell they burst into such weeping and wailing that the noise of their lamentation sounded like unto a clap of thunder. Once again the holy man prayed over us and then dismissed us telling us not to be faint-hearted but bear up bravely, and make mention of me in your prayers. From that hour on, as if moved by some divine providence, the body of faithful people came up of their own accord. And they would not move from the holy man's enclosure until Euphemius, the most holy archbishop of this imperial city, arrived. He mounted the column and looked, and then standing high up on the ladder, announced to all the people, The holy man is still alive and with us, do not be troubled, for it is impossible for his holy body to be consigned to the grave before news of his death, has been published to everyone and all the holy churches everywhere have been informed. And this was done. But I must not forget to mention the greatest thing of all which was indeed worthy of wonder. Three days before his falling asleep in the middle of the night he was allowed to see at one time all those who had been well pleasing to God. They came down and when they had greeted him they bade him celebrate the divine and august sacrament of the Eucharist, and two brethren standing by were allowed to be hearers of the words and to make the due responses. And directly he had completed the liturgy of God he woke up from his trance and coming to himself he asked for the Holy Communion to be administered to him, this was done and he partook first, and we all at that hour of midnight also partook of the holy mysteries just as if he had been administering to us the holy sacrament. Then, bidding farewell to the crowds who surrounded him, he bade the brethren present throw incense into the censer without ceasing. Just about the time of his holy departure from this life a man vexed with an unclean spirit suddenly cried aloud in the midst of the people, announcing the presence of the saints with the holy man, naming each one of them, and he said, There is great joy in heaven at that this hour, for the holy angels have come to take the holy man with them, besides there are come, too, the honourable and glorious companies of prophets and apostles and martyrs and saints, they are tormenting me now, and tomorrow at the third hour they will drive me out of this tabernacle, when the holy man is going to his home in the heavens and his saintly corpse is being brought down, I shall come out. And this did indeed happen. Our glorious father Daniel died at the third hour on the following day, a Saturday, December 11th in the second indiction, A. D. 493, and at the time of his death he worked a miracle in that the man with an unclean spirit was healed. When they took down the railing they found his knees drawn up to his chest, and his heels and legs to his thighs. And whilst his body was being forcibly straightened, his bones creaked so loudly that we thought his body would be shattered, yet when he was laid out, he was quite entire except that his feet had been worn away by inflammation and the gnawing of worms. The weight of the hair of his head was divided into twelve plaits, each of which was four cubits long, likewise his beard was divided into two and each plait was three cubits long. Most of the Christ-loving men saw this. They clad him, as was his wont, in a leather tunic, and a plank was brought up and laid on the column and he was placed on it. At early dawn the Archbishop Euphemius, dearly beloved of God, came and went up the column by the spiral way and kissed the precious corpse, and thus, too, did all the faithful high dignitaries and officials, for they went up to the head of the column, gave their benediction and kissed his blessed body and came down. But the people demanded that the holy man should be shown to them before his burial, and in consequence an extraordinary tumult arose. For by the archbishop's orders the plank was stood upright the body had been fixed, to it so that it could not fall and thus, like an icon, the holy man was displayed to all on every side, and for many hours the people all looked at him and also with cries and tears besought him to be an advocate with God on behalf of them all. When this had been done, behold, all the people suddenly saw clearly with the naked eye three crosses in the sky above the corpse and white doves flying round it. 
Next there was great anxiety about the manner of bringing it down for the funeral, for the Archbishop Euphemius was afraid the corpse might be torn asunder by the crowd, so he ordered it to be put into a case of lead, and this coffin the aforementioned illustries, the most pious her eyes, also provided. This coffin was raised on the shoulders of the most holy Archbishop Euphemius and he bore it together with the noblest officials and pious men, and they brought down the corpse by way of the spiral stairway without its being hurt. But in order to receive a blessing the people rushed forward in front of the entry to the chapel and as the planks could not bear such a sudden rush they parted from each other and all the men who were carrying the coffin were thrown to the ground with the holy corpse. By the grace of the Lord the carriers did not suffer any injury nor did they give way, but they most marvellously withstood the onrush of the crowd so that among those countless thousands of men, women and children not a single one sustained any harm. And Daniel was brought into the oratory and laid to rest underneath the holy martyrs as he had wished. These few short reminiscences out of many, beloved, we have recorded in this our work as best we might. We rejected a multitude of words in order to avoid satiety, and all the numberless incidents have been omitted, we are assured that these will suffice the faithful for remembrance and give them all that they desire. Now let us in a short summary review his whole life down to the end of his time on earth. Our all-praiseworthy father Daniel bade adieu to his parents when he was twelve years old, then for twenty-five years he lived in a monastery, after that for five years he visited the fathers and from each learned what might serve his purpose, making his anthology from their teaching. At the time when the crown of his endurance began to be woven the saint had completed his forty-second year, and at that age he came by divine guidance, as we have explained above, to this our imperial city. He dwelt in the church for nine years, standing on the capital of a column, thus training himself beforehand in the practice of that discipline which he was destined to bring to perfection. For he had learned from many divine revelations that his duty was to enter upon the way of life practised by the blessed and sainted Simeon. For three and thirty years and three months he stood for varying periods on the three columns, as he changed from one to another, so that the whole span of his life was a little more than eighty-four years. During these he was deemed worthy to receive the prize of his high calling, he blessed all men, he prayed on behalf of all, he counselled all not to be covetous, he instructed all in the things necessary to salvation, he showed hospitality to all, yet he possessed nothing on earth beyond the confines of the spot on which the enclosure and religious houses had been built. And though many, amongst whom were sovereigns and very distinguished officials occupying the highest posts, wished to present him with splendid possessions he never consented, but he listened to each one's offer and then prayed that he might be recompensed by God for his pious intention. While we bear in mind our Holy Father's spiritual counsels let us do our utmost, to follow in his steps and to preserve the garment of our body unspotted and to keep the lamp of faith unquenched, carrying the oil of sympathy in our vessels that we may find mercy and grace in the day of judgment from the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost now and henceforth and to all eternity, Amen.